So today we're going to talk about, we've been looking at Nehemiah, uh, both the book and the person. Remember, we're going more thematically. We're not going a verse by verse walkthrough. I want to encourage you, read the story of Nehemiah. As we've been looking at it, there's a lot there. He's a great resource, a great encouragement. It's a really incredible story. And we're going to look at another topic, another aspect of his life today that we should be following. That's the idea of prayer. Now, I know when many of us in a church context here, we're going to talk about prayer. We probably go, I know about prayer. We talk about it. But I think there's a difference in things that we talk about and things that we do. And so I want to, I want to walk through and look at Nehemiah's example this morning. And no matter where you are, whether you say, hey, I actually, I have a pretty solid prayer life. That's awesome. I hope this is encouraging to you. Or maybe if you're like, well, going into my room or wherever I am and closing my eyes and talking to God, man, that's super uncomfortable. And I don't know what to say. You're in good company. And Nehemiah is going to be able to provide you some examples of what praying in different times and different styles looks like. And we're going to touch on a couple of those as we walk through. Prayer, for, for those of you that want to follow Jesus, prayer is fundamental. It's key. It's important. And I'm not making that up. As we study scripture, we see time and again men and women of faith seeking God in prayer, of seeking to align themselves with him. So I think with that, because it's so important, before we look at Nehemiah's specific examples and his style of prayer, it's important that we take a moment, we understand this idea a little bit more, we under, understand prayer, and it, we'll see in just a moment that it's spread all throughout Scripture but I have a question first. If you and I were to sit down one-on-one -on -one, and I was to ask you, what is prayer to you? How would you define it? What comes to mind when we say prayer or the act of praying? Does anyone want to share? What comes to mind when we hear that word? Talking to God one on one. Yeah. What else? What's maybe hard about prayer? And you don't have to share for you specifically. This is a safe space, but you could even say, well, I think for the average Christian, this is what, when they think about prayer, this is why it's hard or awkward or, or whatever. What comes to mind? Yeah, Blake. It feels like you're talking to nobody. Feels like you're talking to nobody? Yeah, yeah totally. Like, I'm sitting in my room, just... Just talking. Hope nobody thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> what else? I suppose the hardest part would be just finding the will to be great and versus saying, like, I don't have time. Finding the will to? Yeah, we say we don't have time. Totally. The words. The words, just knowing what to say? Okay. Yeah. The act of, like, repentance. Ooh. Yeah, you're like, well, the Bible says I need to include repentance in praying. I don't really want to repent, so maybe I just won't. So as we look through Scripture, we see I only pulled, I don't know, like eight different verses. We're not going to look at all of these. You can make note. You can take a picture of something if you want to go back later. Um, just on what does the Bible say about prayer? We see right away one of the most prominent ones, and we're going to look at it at the very end today. Uh, Matthew 6, the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's important to know Jesus gave us an example. When we say, I don't know how to pray, Jesus said, pray like this. And we can see how he himself prayed. Uh, Philippians talks about presenting our requests to God. James even tells us to be praying for one another. And we're going to be looking at, at that this year as we go through James on Tuesday nights. James' encouragement, he seeks people to pray for one another. Matthew 26, to pray against temptation. 1 Timothy, something that probably not a lot of people do right now, but in, in 1 Timothy, Paul's encouraging this young man, pray for those in authority. Pray for the government. Maybe applicable right now, especially. In Psalm, we're told that the Lord hears the prayers of the righteous. In Luke 18, Jesus taught the disciples 
to be praying always and to never give up. And in 1 Thessalonians, Paul again is telling this church, pray continuously, pray without ceasing. Anthony, will you do me a favor? Amanda Jackson are in the hallway. Will you just go get her presentation up here in my office? Thank you. So as we look throughout the Bible, and I want to encourage you, go and study. This is only a couple. There's, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of, of verses that talk about prayer. We start to get an idea of what prayer is. And like was said, prayer is our communication with God. Prayer is the way that we communicate with him. Everything else aside, that's absolutely incredible that the God of the universe that created everything wants to hear from us. But there's a few things that, that we learn about prayer. And some of these might sound a little weird, but I hope you can understand it. The first, prayer is not for God. He's omniscient. He's omnipotent. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere. He already knows. He's not lonely. He's not dependent on us for his own comfort. But he wants to hear from his people because he desires a relationship with us. And prayer is one of the major ways that this type of communication is established. So in some way, we can take comfort knowing the things that we're going to God in, he already knows. And sometimes that makes it a little bit easier to walk through things. Really, prayer, in a lot of ways, is for the individual because it, what it's doing is it's cementing our dependence on God. A major aspect of prayer is this idea of surrender and submission. Because authentic prayer, what it's doing is it's saying, God, here is what's going on in whatever area and whatever type and whatever mode, and I am acknowledging that you are more sovereign and I'm willing to surrender to you. I want your will to be greater than my own. Really, if we think about it, prayer is a realignment. Prayer has to do with coming back under and into the fold of God and acknowledging those things and being able to, to talk about them. It bolsters faith that God is involved in situations. And really, at different times, even in my life, it helps decisions not be made so rashly because it provides an opportunity of pause, of prayer, and being able to walk through things maybe a little bit more clear-minded. It's real, it's alive, it's active, it's powerful. There's a lot of different types of prayer in the Bible. If we go back and study, we see different types. They fall into different categories, whether it be repentance or seeking something or whatever it may be. There's so many different types of prayer, but we're going to be looking at prayer a little bit more broad. And then Nehemiah is going to give us his, his couple of examples of prayer. So when we look at Nehemiah, last week we looked at the idea of empathy and we saw, said Nehemiah is an example of what it means to be empathetic. Nehemiah is also someone who ex exhibits an example of prayer because he's actively living out his relationship with God. He understands who God is. Nehemiah understands who he is under God's authority. And we see an example of a man living out an incredible faith. And with that, Prayer. We're going to see Nehemiah demonstrates in his book two types of prayer in three broad situations. And what we see is his first response in these different situations is to pray. He's always including it. He's practicing what Paul would later encourage the church to do, and that's pray continuously. And it should be reflective in our life as well. So his first thing, his first two types of prayer, we're calling big block and specific focus. This big block prayer, this is intentional set aside time. This is what we would call like a quiet time where it's, I'm going to walk away from the distractions. I'm going to put away my phone. I'm going to turn off the TV. I'm going to go and I'm going to spend this time before the Lord. I'm going to seek him. I'm going to talk to him. I'm also going to allow him time to communicate with me and I'm going to be intentional. And then these specific focus prayers are highlighted moments in the midst of something seeking the Lord in a moment. And we see these examples play out in his life and we begin to recognize they should be playing out in our life because both are needed and both are important. If prayer can, is concerned with our relationship with God and is our communication with him, both of these are important. One 
is not more important than the other. We cannot rely on one. We cannot just rely on these intentional set-aside times, and we cannot just rely on specific kind of rifle shot, intentional focus prayer. We need this combination of both, and that's because they're designed to work together. And we can think about it like this. Think about a relationship, a friendship, okay? I'll talk about my relationship with Amanda. We try to establish set time throughout the day or throughout the week that it's just us. Obviously harder right now, Jackson's usually around for the ride. Whether it be going out to dinner or making dinner at home or going for a drive, we have specific set aside time in our schedule every day to engage with one another, to talk, to discuss what's going on, how are you doing, what are you feeling about this, what's going on in the world, and we have these intentional blocks. Now it's not, it's not all day every day, but maybe it's we get home from work like today. We'll get home and later this evening, we will make dinner and we will spend some time just talking. And that's intentional set aside time. And that's good. And that's important. But then there come other moments where there needs to be a specific momentary single focus conversation. It could be something serious. It could be something fun, whatever it is. I can't live in a relationship with my wife if something comes up. Let's say this. Last week I was hanging out uh, with some other youth pastors and their or other youth pastors, and we we're talking about a retreat that we want to do for youth pastors and our wives. We do it every year. It's it's great. Now I got the details for it, and I just texted Amanda because there's a specific thing she needs to get this on our calendar so that we both know that it's happening. Let's be in agreement. I couldn't say, "Well, guys, that sounds really cool." Sunday night is Amanda's and my time to talk. I'll add it to the list. We'll get to it then. That's not a healthy aspect of a relationship. We need both of these things. And it's the same with our relationship with God. It's important to have these intentional set aside blocks of time, these quiet times that we seek him. But then it's also important in the spur of the moment when stuff's happening, good, bad, or otherwise, to be able to, re to call out to him. For me, lately, one of my intentional quiet times is about a half hour every night as I'm rocking Jackson to sleep. And what I've realized is that's a great time. Jackson's falling asleep. He's pretty chill. That I can read my Bible. And actually, I've been reading it out loud. I know he's only two months old, but I like the idea of getting it in there early. He's going to start contemplating things, and I want him to grow up and follow Jesus. And then I spend time praying. And yeah, it is kind of weird. Like I'm in his room in a rocking chair in the dark talking out loud. I'm not a huge fan of the dark. I'll admit, sometimes my eyes are open, but that's okay. But it's an intentional time with me and God. And generally it's concerning praying for my son and praying for you guys. But then there come up other moments throughout the day that I need to intentionally and specifically reach out to God. There may be something bad. Maybe I get a phone call of something that's going on. A, a few weeks ago, my aunt, she's been fighting Alzheimer's for the last 10 years, uh, got the call that she's on hospice care. So she has 24 seven care and they're basically waiting for her to pass away. Now, when I got that call, I did not say, oh man, that's really tough news. I should pray for her and my uncle tonight at, at 1030. That's when I'll add it to the to-do list. It's like, no, in that moment, that specific moment, I need to go to God and I need to seek him. What happens if we start to let prayer slip is it really leads to a lack of vibrancy in a relationship with God. It just becomes, yes, I read my Bible, I served, I did this, but we've cut out communication. Imagine a relationship, a friendship, that you completely stop talking to one another. And you're like, oh, well, we're still at youth group and we're still at church twice a week together. Maybe we're on, on the same sports team or we have classes together, but we never talk one-on-one. -on -one probably not going to last very long. It's not going to be a very vibrant relationship. And God wants that with us. And what we have to understand is when we decide to not seek him, we decide to not communicate him, we're not depriving God of anything. We're really depriving ourselves. We're depriving ourselves of this opportunity to develop an intimate, ongoing relationship with the Father. Nehemiah models this uh, consistent commitment to come before God whenever he reached a point in his journey in his life uh, when a decision had to be made. Let's look at a couple of those times. So you can open up to Nehemiah. 
Old Testament, right before uh, Psalm, right after Ezra. And we see three situations. Now, these are not the only times in the book of Nehemiah that Nehemiah prays, but these three highlight the three times, the three reasons that he prays. So the first, Nehemiah 1.4. Who will read that for us? Thank you, sir. So we've talked about this. This is kind of where we've been sitting for most of our time in Nehemiah. He hears of what is going on with the Jewish people, with Jerusalem, and he sits down and he prays. He says, this is my time. I need to go before the Lord. It's kind of a combination of both an intentional set aside, big block prayer and specific focus prayer all at once. But when there is this, when there is bad news, the first thing Nehemiah does is pray because what he's doing is he's coming under the authority of God. Second time, Nehemiah 2, 1 through 5. Who's got that? Thank you, sir. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King... Um, That's right. There's a lot of weird names. Um, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I have not been so sad in, the pre in his presence before. So the king asked me, why does your face look so sad when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid, but then I said to the king, May the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my fathers are buried lies in ruins, and its gates have been destroyed by fire? The king said to me, was it you? Uh, what is it you want? Then I prayed to God, to the God of heaven, and I answered the king. If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city of Judah, where my fathers are buried, so I can rebuild it. So I like to call this is Nehemiah prayed when there was a ministry opportunity. So this kind of for us, takes the story of Nehemiah to the next level. What's going on is Nehemiah has it laid on his heart uh, by the Lord that Jerusalem is in ruin, and it's your job to help fix that. And Nehemiah knows he's being tasked with going and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. Remember, he, he's second man to the king. He's the king's cupbearer. So the king sees him a lot, and the king notices that something's wrong. Uh, one Note I read on this last week when I was putting this together said that this is actually several months between chapters one and two. So Nehemiah, this has been weighing on him for some time. And the king finally asks him, like, what's wrong? And Nehemiah lays the groundwork saying, well, I, I don't know if you've heard, but here's what's happened to my people. And here's what's happened with their city. And yeah, let me just state some facts for you. And the king says, well, what do you want to do about it? And it's important to note what Nehemiah did. He inserts there, and then I prayed to God. That's an exact example of one of those specific momentary prayers. He's in the middle of the conversation saying, there is a problem. And someone says, well, what do you want to do about it? Lord, I need you right now to help give me the strength for what I'm about to ask. And he asks the king, as we see there and then further as it unfolds in chapter 2, He's fairly bold. He asks them for the men, the supplies, the resources, the permission to return to Jerusalem and rebuild it. And the king grants him incredible favor and he's able to go and, and work on the walls of Jerusalem. But with this opportunity, a ministry opportunity, and you don't have to work in ministry. Jesus, or Jesus, Nehemiah was not a pastor. He wasn't working for a church. Yet this was a ministry opportunity to act in obedient response to what God, God calls us to do is to be engaged in ministry. There may be something that you look at and someone, even God says, well, what are you going to do about it? Take that moment. Seek the Lord. And then the third time is when there was opposition. You can, you can read for it yourself, chapter 4, 1 through 9. It's only one of the instances. Uh, we're going to talk about opposition more next week and just the reality of it because when you're doing the work of God in a fallen, sinful, sinful world, there's going to be people that don't like that. 
And what we're going to see in the story of Nehemiah, and you can study through it yourselves, is there's several instances where groups of people, generally led by a couple of specific people, uh, come against Nehemiah seeking to stop what he's doing. And in the midst of every single one of those, it says that Nehemiah pauses and he prays. Opposition, he prays. This, he prays. We begin to see this unfold. And it's all because he was able to pray like this. And I know for me, when I was your age, it's like, man, sometimes I don't even think to pray in those moments. I don't know what to pray. It sounds weird. I don't know what to do. But he was able to pray intentionally and directly because he held some really firm beliefs of who God is. And these beliefs are what motivate him. If you were to study the life of Nehemiah intensely, you would begin to see some of the beliefs that Nehemiah holds to be true about God. That he's a covenant, promise-keeping God. That even in the midst of exile, Nehemiah can say, Lord, you kept your end of the deal. You keep your promises. It's us that messed it up. Nehemiah understands that God hears his people. And that God is powerful and merciful. What this all gets wrapped up in is that Nehemiah, just like we talked about with empathy last week, has a clear and right understanding, firm beliefs in who God is and who Nehemiah himself is within that. And that's what motivates him in his prayer life. For us, it's as simple as this. Our personal beliefs about God, about who he is, drives our personal doctrine and then that motivates how we're going to pursue him. We have to sort through what do we believe about God because those are what, those ideas, those truths will be what motivates us and to what extent we choose to engage with him. Nehemiah studied the Torah, first five books of the Bible, and whatever Old Testament was available to him at that point. And what he's doing in all of these prayers is he's actually praying scripture. And he's praying scripture because he studied it. He knows it. And he didn't have Google. He didn't have an app on his phone to be able to do a quick word search. And he's like, oh, man, this is really difficult. Scripture on opposition. Oh, I'll, I'll read this. No, he knew it because he, he, he knew it. In both his head and his heart, he had studied it and he understood it. He drew back on verses, especially from Deuteronomy 4 and 7, to develop this understanding of who God is. He took that intentional time. As we study about Jesus, as we begin to understand more about him, we should be driven, just like Nehemiah, to pursue and engage with Jesus. The more Nehemiah studied scripture, the more he understood to be true about God. Nehemiah probably had five books and understood these truths about God to be merciful, just, promise-keeping. He knew the Messiah was coming. He knew God would equip him. He knew all of these from five books. We have 66. How much more should we recognize who God is? Your personal belief about who God is will impact how you choose to pursue him. If you've been tracking or want to feel closer to him or even want to engage with Jesus, the first time, the first step is prayer. The first way to get to know somebody is to start talking to them. Amanda and I met four years ago. Uh, I think you guys all know we, we did the, the classic modern day way of meeting somebody. We met on the internet. Uh, I know, classy. But hey, it works. Go to it. Yeah, applaud the internet. But, <laughs> stop it. <laughs> What we did first is we began talking with one another. Our first step wasn't to go try to find out other people that might know them and see that or, or just sit and stare at one another's Facebook pages trying to develop an understanding and a relationship with that person. We talked with one another. And it's the same way with Jesus. When we want to get to know him, whether it's continually a little bit of a restart or for the first time, we have to talk to him. He's ready, he's willing, he wants to hear from his people, he wants to hear from you, he just wants to talk to you. And then I want to encourage you as that develops, follow the example of Nehemiah. Set aside intentional time every day. I know the excuses. You're busy, I get it, I guarantee there's time. 
It takes intentionality. It takes a desire to do it. These things don't just happen overnight. To follow Jesus, there's an element of personal loss. There's an element of being a little bit inconvenienced about shifting around your priorities. But find some intentional time throughout the day. Engage with scripture and just talk with him. Even if your prayer one day is like, Jesus, I, I don't know how to do this, so I'm just going to kind of sit here and just kind of ramble about my day. Beautiful. Whatever it needs to be. He wants to hear what you're struggling with. The good, the bad, the highs and the lows like you guys share on Tuesdays with your group. Talk about that with God. He desires this from his people. If prayer is hard for you, let's talk about it. Let's talk, you can talk to me. You can talk to your leaders. You can talk to one another. It'll change your life to be able to seek Jesus in intentional prayer. Look at Nehemiah as an example. The dude was leading a group of people to rebuild the walls of a city that had been broken down by people that wanted them dead while those same people are there shouting insults trying to get them to stop. Nothing for nothing, but he, he found time. I bet we can find time. We might have to get creative. And that's awesome. I think when we get creative even about how to pray, uh, God recognizes that and says, this is great. So-and-so is wanting to engage with me and they're being, they're being creative about it. Maybe it's you drive the same way every day. Maybe it's that 10, 15, 20-minute drive that's a great time to be praying for, for life, for people. Maybe it's setting aside that intentional day like I shared with you. For me, it's been that time rocking Jackson to sleep every night. And Man, there are some nights I don't feel like it. A couple nights ago, I didn't really feel like it, so I rocked him. Got him pretty much asleep, put him to bed, and he woke up not long after. And I took that as like, all right, fair enough. Take my son back, and I'll go do what I was meant to do and engage in that time of prayer and scripture reading with him. And then Amanda and I, we're, we're very diligent. We do our best to pray every night together. We pray throughout the day because we want it to match this idea of communication. We want our communication with one another to be reflective of what we communicate with God, that it's specific time set aside, but it's also random throughout the day. God wants to hear from us. So if it's hard for you, look at the example of Nehemiah. Look at an example of someone who was driven by their relationship and belief in God. And again, he had five books and understood who God was, and it motivated him to do incredible things. We've got 66. Back there on the wall, we have our prayer board. It's been up for a couple years, thanks to Kirk and Sherry. It's awesome. I love our youth room so much. I love walking in here. It makes me smile. It feels so good in here. Uh, I mentioned recently that I went through while we were all stuck at home and took all the, the stuff off of it, because coming into this year and, and looking at Nehemiah and this underlying theme of of rebuilding, of rebuilding relationships with one another, rebuilding our youth group's alignment with God, maybe our individual alignments with God. I said, you know, now's a great time. Not that those things on there didn't matter. We still have them. They're still absolutely important. But now's kind of a good time to, to clean the slate and to start, start new. I want to encourage you guys, utilize that as a resource. There's tags and pens in there. Uh, you can write down something you might be praying for, something that the Lord lays on your heart. Be good, little man. Oh, man, bless my wife. She's awesome. Oh, life is so good, you guys. But utilize that board. There's requests and praises or answered prayers. Utilize it. Uh, you don't have to put your name on it, but if there's something that you're like, man, I'm struggling or there's someone on my heart, write it down and hang it up there, and then the rest of us will support you in looking at it and praying for it. If you see something hanging up there, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Take a picture of it with your phone. Set yourself a reminder, and later that day when it reminds you, open up that picture, read what it has to say, and spend some time praying for that person. Even if you don't know who it is, that's okay. <laughs> and I'm going to try to periodically take pictures of there, and we'll post them on the social media pages that we have so we can see what are other people praying for in our youth group. What do people need help with? And we can rally around, just like James talks about, praying for one another. I think... If we had a piece of paper up here and I said, what are some things that we could be praying about these days? We could probably come up with quite a list. I want to encourage you guys to think bigger than just yourself this year. This week, pick specific things to be praying about and think about the things that are going on uh, in our church. Think about the things that are going on in our country, in our world, 
and lift those things up to the Father. We need Jesus. And what our culture needs, as much as it's tried to push it, as much as it doesn't want it, is it needs the body of Christ to be unified together and under the Lord. We've done a pretty good job of kicking out Jesus. And now we're living in a little bit of the repercussion of that, and it's not going to get better. We as the church need to stand firm for him. And so I want to encourage you, lift up one another, lift up the church, lift up church leadership, lift up the election time, the people that are running. I think political parties aside, none of us should envy the people that are getting elected into, a different, into different positions. And I really hope we can all set aside our own personal preferences, our own inclinations, all of that, and say, I don't care what the name is or what the little letter next to their name is. I'm going to lift them up in prayer. We're going to close with the Lord's Prayer. This is uh, Jesus' instruction to us given uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon in history ever given. You can go read it out. Matthew uh, details it. And in the middle of it, Jesus knows that sometimes praying is weird and we don't know what to say. Scripture also tells us when we don't know that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit himself, intercedes on our behalf that he gives us the words before the Father. Uh, and Jesus gives us this as a template. And it's important to know this is a template. It's good to pray Scripture. If you go and you, you pray this occasionally, if your heart's in the right place, that's awesome. Uh, it's more than that. It's bigger than that. Jesus says, pray like this. And he gives us these couple of sentences, just an example, as an encouragement of how to pray. That it doesn't take these long, drawn-out phrases and words. Jesus actually criticizes that if your heart's not in the right place. He says, this is what it's like to pray to the God, or to pray to God, to pray to the Father. So we're going to close with this. Uh, I'm going to mix some stuff in throughout it as I, as I read through it, that we can see how can we be applying and praying through the Lord's Prayer in our own lives. Uh, when we're done, you're welcome to hang out, and we have the Mexico meeting afterwards for those of you that want to stick around. But let's go to the Lord. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. God, you are incredible. You are good and gracious more than we can ever understand, but Lord, you are truly holy. Thank you for a time this morning of being able to worship as a church to sing to you lord your kingdom come your will on uh, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven lord we want to see lives change we want to see the gospel advanced in this area lord our culture needs you and our culture needs your church to reflect who you really are lord setting aside differences and discrepancies and rallying around your gospel lord give us today our daily bread lord you know what we need and we fully recognize that sometimes our wants don't match our needs and you know what we need lord you supply us you equip us we know that the breath in our lungs is your very breath lord may you give these students what they need for today you tell us not long after this to not worry about tomorrow so may we be focused on today, Lord. May we, may we look to you. May you supply the energy that's needed, the mental space for homework, Lord, whatever it may be, the time for other people. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lord, like was mentioned, one of the hardest things about prayer is repentance. Lord, may we come before you with, with open hands, offering to you the things that we've done that are against your will today and this week, Lord, the actions, the thoughts, whatever it may be, and may we surrender that to you. May you forgive us, and may we each feel your cleansing mercy come over us this week. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, Lord. Keep these students strong. Equip them. Help them to stand firm in the face of temptation. Be alive and real in their lives, Lord, that they may recognize that you are greater and better than anything this world has to offer. Be with us today, Lord. In your son's name, amen.